Torej, lepo pozdravljeni na festivalu Stripa Tinta. Čaka nas masterclass. Za pokroviteljstvo se zahvaljujem tudi Outfitu 7, ki je poskrbel za to, da je danes Peter Kuper z nami. Poleg tega seveda se moram zahvaliti tudi veleposlaneštvu Združenih držav Amerike v Sloveniji, ki nam je prav tako pripomogal k temu, da je Peter Kuper danes z nami. Predvsem pa gre za hvala še dvema založbama, ki sta v letošnjem letu založili oziroma prevedli dva njegova stripa. Eden je bil preveden pri Strip Burgerju oziroma Forumu Ljubljana, gre za kratke zgodbe Franca Kafke, no ravno v tem tednu pa smo dobili še prevod preobrazb, predtem pa še kak mesec nazaj prevod srca teme. Peter Kuper, ki je danes z nami, je sicer že kar nekaj časa na sceni, je ameriški striper, ilustrator, tudi profesor, redno objavlja v The New Yorker magazine The Nation, v med je ustanovitelj revije World War III, Tri Illustrated, ki izhaja že 41 let. Narisal je že več kot dva ducata knjig in kot rečeno menda poleg teh treh izdaj, ki jih imamo zdaj v slovenščini, nas menda čakajo tudi še nekatere nove. Kaj več o tem nam bo povedal sam, predvsem pa o tem, na kakšen način se sam loteva ustvarjanja. So, Peter Cooper is already here with us online. Thank you very much for being here in a virtual world. Maybe just for the beginning, a short question. Are you really coming to Slovenia in person next year? That, that is my plan. I'm very much looking forward to it, and I was very sorry not to be there this year. Well, but, we are uh, also looking forward, but we're also looking forward to your uh, master class today. So I will stop talking, and I'm giving you the word and the screen. Thank you. So let me start here. So... Can everybody see this all right? Are you seeing my, the show and me? Both? Good. Um, so first, first of all, I just wanted to say thank you for having me for this. And thank you, uh, Pia and uh, Katarina for uh, organizing the show and Tanya and Strip Burger for all the many, many years of giving me the opportunity to have my work there. And more recently to have editions of my, my books um, like Heart of Darkness and Kafkaesque and uh, The Metamorphosis. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about all of those things. Um, but I thought I would start with giving you some of the secrets of the graphic novelist um, that should help you along if you want to do this so you'll understand what is involved in that process. Um, so... This is pretty much it. You have to be excited about a career in the arts and incapable of a nine to five job. So that, that's pretty much my secret. Uh, I don't have a plan B. I have to draw comics. Um, and uh, otherwise, in the event of war, I'm a hostage. So, um, so our understanding of images goes all the way back to um, cave drawings. Um, we've been, there, there's no sign of the music that we might have um, uh, sung, uh, there's, there, the, 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 what's left behind are some tools, probably a few weapons and, and the art, the, you know, the culture that we left are these, these cave paintings. And if it weren't for these things, we would not know, um, our shopping habits, for example. Um, this actually was Banksy did this and he put it in the uh, British museum and it stayed up in the prehistoric art collection for, I think two weeks before somebody noticed there was a shopping cart in it. Oh, that Banksy. So our first language is actually in pictograms. We, we, the, you know, we started with image. And so all of us in our DNA is really an understanding of images first. Uh, these, this, uh, the codexes from, uh, from um, Mexico uh, that um, mostly were burned, but fortunately there was one nice uh, friar who saved uh, one of them. So we know what they looked like when the conquistadors came to uh, the Americas. Um, and these really were like comics. They, they read, they read, they had characters, recurring, uh, recurring characters. They read down and across. 
Um, and they had all this was done with visual information. Um, this is a tapestry from, uh, I think, 1200s. It's the history of uh, the world, um, you know, the God creating the world done in panels. Um, it's entirely a comic strip. There's recurring characters. God's a recurring character. So is Jesus. Um, you may have grown up looking at this comic. Um, so these are, you know, what, what we didn't think of as sequential. And, you know, this is this is a short version, but there's, you know, elaborate storytelling that goes on in, in various stained glass. Um, I also, I, I spent uh, a couple of years in Mexico and um, I started looking at the murals. This is by Diego Rivera. And I realized how much these murals are like comics. They have uh, recurring characters. There's a character here that's also down here. There's Cortez here and here and here. Um, the, there's the storytelling is going on. If you look at it, they're arriving. All the actions are going on. The, the terrible things that they're doing, uh, and that that's that's all like you read it in a uh, um, a flowing sequence. Um, I'm also really interested in, in the idea of how history was captured through art. Um, Goya um, was he was a court painter, but he also did, um, you know, in his spare time did covered scenes of war and um, uh, devastation um, that are a record of what happened that we wouldn't otherwise have. Uh, Daumier in France, uh, when he when he drew uh, King, uh, uh, is it Louis Philippe, Philippe or Philippe Louis, I always forget. Anyway, uh, he spent six months in jail for this drawing of the king. Um, so there's, it can be treacherous doing political art. Uh, Kathy Colwitz and uh, John Hartfield um, were doing uh, drawings of Hitler as he rose up. They had, they had to usually flee, the artists that did this had to flee the country because they would have been um, uh, murdered if they, uh, if they st stuck around while trying to inform the public about the threat of the Nazis. Uh, in the United States, there was Thomas Nast, who's a great uh, um, hero and, and um, success story. In the middle there, it, the middle vulture is a guy named Boss Tweed. And um, Thomas Nast drew him again and again and again. And this is in the 1800s, 1871 for this particular piece. And because of this drawing, the, he was a corrupt, New York um, Wheeler dealer. He 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 was running the, the the political machine in New York and and stealing millions of dollars. And he fled to Portugal. And the uh, customs officials recognized him from Thomas Nast drawings. He was arrested and he died penniless in jail. Woohoo! So we can hope that art can do this. Um, and then there are the magazines like Strip Burger, for example, <laughs> that give a forum to uh, art like this. Back in uh, 1915, it was the masses. Um, and um, and also, you know, it, there's a lot of art that um, only more kind of more recently has been been um, brought to the front. People, you know, black artists like Jacob Lawrence, who um, did essentially a comic strip of the migration, the black migration north um, from the southern states. Uh, Romare Bearden was in New York doing these collages, amazing. And this is from the 1940s, 50s, 60s. Um, and um, so, the, you know, there's a lot of, you know, these are the more prominent artists of that era. But of course, there's lots and lots of artists that you never heard their names who are also doing potent work. Um, that's another Romare Bearden. Uh, Kara Walker more um, recently, she's doing work where she's using the icons and symbols that were used uh, against black people um, that, that were, you know, portraits that were making fun of. Um, and then she's turned them to her own uses, but also, you know, uh, raised up more powerful images that that go back to uh, so-called primitive art. But there's an example of her using these symbols of um, these cutouts that um, were um, often uh, not kind portraits of, you know, stereotypes, but then using them to advantage to uh, remind us of that history. 
Um, so one one of the books that very, very happily that that it's Strip Burger published was uh, my Kafka short story collection, Kafka esque. Um, and one of the amazing things about Kafka is that he his stories are so open to interpretation. So I could take this one before the law and um, have it be the, the story of uh, of a black man trying to get justice. Um, and um, that the idea that that um, what I heard in his story was a lot of possibilities. And this was just one of them. And, uh, you know, I hope that somebody who reads my adaptation will go to the actual text of Kafka and see what interpretation they come up with it, that, uh, you know, mine is just one. And there's, you know, so many different ways to, um, to uh, read these. Um, so these are just some examples of ways I've interpreted his stories. Um, and that's the US edition cover. Um, another one of the books that was, that was published recently. Um, so, uh, uh, Heart of Darkness is talking about the Congo. It's, it doesn't, uh, specifically reference the Congo, but when I did an adaptation, I did. And it was ironically, not intentionally, ironically, uh, when Belgium took it over in the, when, when Europe cut up Africa in 1885, um, uh, uh, the King of Belgium uh, bought the Congo what he were like with his own money so that he'd have a piece of Africa. And um, uh, thanks to um, uh, Henry Morton Stanley, who uh, famously uh, a famous explorer crossed Africa and could come back and tell uh, the king about what was available there and um, sur amazingly survived his trek, but also helped the the colonial move to um, go into Africa and basically, you know, rape the country. Um, there's estimates between one and 15 million Congolese who were who were murdered. Um, th that dwarfs so many other big numbers we have, um, like uh, you know, six million Jews in, in World War II. Um, not to mention, you know, f f the other millions that that died there, but um, one of the greatest genocides in the world. Um, and so there's the conference I was referring to that carved up Africa and there's King Leopold II. Um, so he went in there and he was, he was going after, um, ivory. Um, Conrad, Joseph Conrad, um, uh, was a young man, went down there, uh, to, um, he, he was, you know, kind of adventurer, but it was a job. And he was going to be there for two years, but he got sick and he was, he left within six months. He was on this, uh, this really <laughs> tiny little boat called the King of the uh, Belgians and um, um, made his way up river on this, on this tiny craft. And they were, um, a lot of what was going on there was the uh, going after ivory. Um, I had the good fortune to actually see his diary from that time period, which they have at Harvard. And uh, um, and while I was collecting reference in order to work on the um, the adaptation, um, and I actually I, I um, moved to Mexico for four months uh, leading while I was working on this adaptation. It was perfect because I I couldn't go to the Congo, um, but I could go someplace that had uh, was very warm. Um, the smells were sort of probably similar to what I might've seen there with burning wood and plastic. And, um, uh, and I also got stung by in various insects and then, um, got a really good case of, uh, uh, the flu for about a month. And then I got something called scabies, which is sort of like this itchy insect gets under your skin. So it's just perfect for uh, working on the adaptation. So, um, Ivory was what they first went in there uh, to to extract. The King Leopold was trying to extract to get his money's worth out of having bought the Congo, um, and they extracted it to the point of virtual extinction. Um, and just when things were, he was not making enough money. Um, and this, by the way, so Conrad um, was, turned his experience there into Heart of Darkness, 
and made this uh, publish it as in a magazine first, and then it eventually became um, it was part of a book collection of short stories. And the one of the things that, that he talks about is this, this character Kurtz um, is um, you know uh, Conrad was very much uh, a a, a um, result of his time period. So it wasn't like he certainly had plenty of racism in, in, in his work and in his, his thinking, but there was some forward thinking in there as well. And he really wasn't saying that, um, talking about the savages of, of Africa as much as saying that we all have in us this, this possibility of being savage. And that um, this character Kurtz that he created was, um, was um, the representation of that that very colonial, very uh, um, you know, cultured person going, becoming the savage, and he was possibly based on on this this uh, general uh, Ram who um, did uh, terrible devastation in in uh, the Congo. Um, so lucky for you, Leopold, not so lucky at all for for the Congo. Right about the time that he was digging in there, they um, rubber became very popular with bicycles, bicycle tires, the Dunlap tire. And suddenly the need for rubber was huge. And there was a lot of rubber in the Congo and they extracted it. And they, they extracted it in the worst kind of way. And fortunately, uh, oh, I, I, fortunately, maybe not the right word. There happened to be a missionary down there, this woman, Alice Steely Harris, who photographed the atrocities so that we might know about them. And this helped uh, bring the information about what they were doing in the Congo. Um, they, if you could call it a kindness, they were given a, a certain number of bullets um, that they were supposed to kill one person with each bullet while keeping discipline there. And the, if you can call it kind-hearted colonialists, instead of killing the person, would uh, chop off their hands to show evidence that they had uh, as if they had killed them so they could prove to the king that yes, don't worry, we use that bullet for something. Um, and they were starving the people um, while they were forcing them to extract the rubber. Um, there were, Roger Casement was one uh, along with um, uh, Edmund Morell, um, seeing these photos, reading Heart of Darkness, made a big move to make this very public and let people know what was going on. And it, it, um, it helped cause, uh, um, Leopold to have to, um, uh, as it were, liberate the Congo and, and um, let them uh, um, self-govern and, and get out of there and stop this. But that did, that it took years before that happened. That didn't happen until um, uh, 1908. So there's a long period um, that that uh, this was going on. So it was like 23 years of these atrocities, and it, and it wasn't until the 60s that that they were fully, um, they, they were self-governing. So Youth was where, where um, Heart of Darkness was published. And there has been many, many um, editions of this done. So uh, I was stepping into a large group of things like this and um, some terrible movies too. Um, of course, there was a, the Apocalypse Now, which was a more remarkable example and uh, there were plays and even, even uh, games and perfume. Um, hold on one moment. I just, I think I made a one little error here. I'm gonna just wanna make sure I have the right, sorry, I, Got my Heart of Darkness talk, and I want to grab a different, more, uh, give me a moment. And I have another talk that I want to do that is, sorry about this. Um, Ah, uh, the best laid plans of mice and men. Let me see if that's it. 
because I wanted to talk more about Kafka and some other things like that. And uh, yes, well, this will. All right. Um, I'll fiddle around here for a moment, pardon me. So uh, some more on my earlier career. That's one of my earliest drawings of my mom. Um, this incidentally, that's me in first grade in the back row is my friend Seth DeBachman. Um, we go back a long ways and we've had a long history together. Um, a very early uh, influence for me was a movie called Failsafe. And it was a Cold War era uh, film. And it was about, um, there's an accidental, the United States accidentally bombs Russia. And in order to stop World War III, um, we allow them to bomb one city we allow uh, Russia to bomb the United States and they bomb New York. And uh, I, I saw this as a child and the idea that there was this thing, this bomb that could destroy the city I was intending to move from Cleveland, Ohio to when I, as soon as I could, um, just like uh, exploded in my mind. And, it, and it's really never ended. This, this feeling of like, there's a bomb out there that can just at any moment change everything. Um, and uh, um, it uh, it has been in the background of, of, of my life. Um, another very important influence for me has been travel. And uh, uh, when I was 10, my father had a, uh, a sabbatical and um, we um, moved to Israel for a year. And, um, but before we went there, we bought a VW van and we made our way across Europe camping. And uh, so there's our VW van and we went all the, all around. And I got to see the fact that um, we don't just live, the United States, it's very easy to have a narrow-minded perspective if you don't leave your own country. And I started to see different languages and different cultures. Um, another important uh, impact was Mad Magazine. And in the great irony of things, I have found myself um, working for MAD. And I've worked for them for 25 years doing Spy versus Spy. And uh, um, that's uh, uh, the place where I saw politics and humor meet. And uh, it, it also exploded in my brain and never left. Um, one of my earliest jobs, again, great great irony was as an inker on Richie Rich, the Harvey comics, which also had Casper the Friendly Ghost and uh, Hot Stuff and a number of other characters, Little Dot, Lotta. Um, and this, I came to New York um, hoping to be an animator. That, uh, uh, that job fell through and uh, I just wandered around looking for work and I did samples and was able to become an inker on this comic and I did that for a year and a half. And it was a good training ground for my future work, which uh, ended up turning things like uh, uh, George Bush into Richie Rich. Um, so I found that pretty much everything that I uh, have done in the past has I've, I've managed to drag along, and it's been it's been uh, helpful to me. Um, I you know would have would love to do happier, more upbeat art in general. Um, but I grew up during the Vietnam era watching that on the you know, TV news over dinner. My father obsessively watched the news and we would be saying, you know, pass the potatoes while we watched people shooting each other. And I think that helped uh, develop my twisted sense of humor, but also my desire to talk about politics in my work. Um, to me, it may be hard to tell. Uh, that's my version of Ronald Reagan. When I was in art school, he was just becoming uh, the making his way to being president. And my friend, Seth Tabachman, who I showed you that picture of from first grade, and I had grown up reading comics together and we, had, we did a fanzine together in Cleveland and we both ended up in New York and we both ended up at the same art school, Pratt Institute. And we were doing political comics and we couldn't find any place to publish them. And since we had self-published already, it wasn't a crazy idea to um, do our own magazine. So we started 
publishing this. And it didn't just include, our, it wasn't just our own work. It included other artists and more and more people were coming to us while we were publishing this. And um, over the years, um, uh, it has been a, a wider and wider group who have joined us. And um, uh, crazily, um, it's been 42 years and we are still publishing World War III. And um, the secret to our success, I would say, is um, we've never made a dime. Um, we only spend money on it. So it's, uh, it's, it, it's totally a labor of love. And I recommend to everybody, um, do things that you love because um, when the money doesn't come, you will have done something that you love. And if you uh, do something that you think will make money, but you're not crazy about it, um, then you and you can end up with nobody being happy. Um, you're really only promised an audience of one for your work, and that is yourself. And um, you were also promised in going into art fields, probably of all kinds, whatever it is, music, dance, theater, comics, certainly, um, that failure is going to be a part of this. Um, in many ways, you know, World War III has been around for 42 years. We really haven't, we still don't sell a lot of copies. We, we, we still are a, a somewhat small publication. We haven't changed the world as much as we've wanted to. Um, but um, there's, we're, we're doing something that we love that really matters to us. And so, um, and actually, you know, I, I probably experience some form of failure on a weekly basis because um, the um, uh, I, I pitch work to the New the New Yorker, and um, uh, they will they don't even respond if they don't want to use it. So I may send a cartoon in uh, five days a week, and I I don't hear nothing, and I may sell something in one month uh, of doing that. And so you have to sort of develop your failure muscles. And that's another thing that is really important in, in staying in any of these fields is that when you do fail, as you inevitably will, that you keep going. And um, that's, that's a critical factor. Um, so, I, you know, I've been very fortunate because I uh, have found outlets for the kind of work I wanted to do. I did have to, at a certain point, say, you know, I'm going to stop doing work that isn't um, socially, politically, uh, um, uh, you know, reliant, that it isn't talking about what's going on in the world. Cause I found I was doing illustration work and I, I, you know, making a living at it, but doing things about subjects that didn't interest me at all. And I, I just found like I was compartmentalizing and that just at a certain point with a war going on or a protest going on that I, I or climate change, I just couldn't, uh, compartmentalize anymore. And I felt it took me 10 times as long to do a job about uh, something that didn't interest me as it did about a political subject that felt like it was urgent. And so I started turning down work that didn't apply to my social political uh, um, sensibilities. And I lost a lot of work for a while. And then I started getting the jobs I hoped to get. And that continued and has pretty much been the, the case uh, up to this point. Um, in comics, uh, for the first decade probably of my career, it was almost like a hobby because um, their comics through the 80s were not considered even an art form. In fact, they weren't, um, big publishers weren't interested in, in uh, comics and, uh, until about the year 2000. And I was starting in the field in about 1979 or 80. Um, so my, uh, one of my earliest graphic novels was, oops, <laughs> that would be coming up on the end of my uh, talk. I'll flip a little faster here. This is The Jungle. Um, I did this in 1990. Uh, I turned my uh, travels into comics. Uh, and this was some of the drawings that I did over the years. I also did autobiography, um, pretty much interested in everything that comics can do. So I want to just touch on all those areas, personal stories, sex, drugs, rock and roll, and of course, uh, you know, 9-11 politics and 
you know, how do I draw these things in the face of what's going on? Well, sometimes with the help of my daughter, who I sit and draw with or did. She's now 24, but at the time she was a little kid. Um, do you, you want me to stop or can I keep going a little bit longer, Pia? I think you can keep going. We'll just shorten the question part. Okay, all right. So these, I, I'll, I'll be a little faster here. Sorry, it's amazing how, how much there is to cover. So this is my sketchbook. I, I try to keep a sketchbook going, but even when I'm sitting on the beach, I find myself thinking about that bomb. Uh, I'm, when I moved to Mexico with my wife and daughter in 2006, we had no idea there was a, a giant action going on with, uh, with a political action that turned into federal troops being there. And um, I thought I was going to be escaping the George Bush uh, America and getting a peaceful little uh, sabbatical in Mexico. Turned out uh, it was a little less peaceful. And it made me realize, however, that um, I wasn't interested in escaping um, doing po po political art. I just didn't want to keep doing things about George Bush. Um, so I did things about what happened in Oaxaca, Mexico. And that led to a, a, a collection of my work from that time. And this is a lot of what I, I really try to do with, with my work is have it, I come, I, I come up with the idea and then I look for, for the audience for it rather than waiting for something to come to me. And um, it's really, you know, I, I will do illustrations, ideas, and then go to a magazine or newspaper and pitch them the ideas. Um, this is a fictional account of our time down there. Um, and I coupled that with my interest in um, insects which is what I'm doing now. And in my latest project, I'm working on a, a whole book about the history of insects and the people who study them. Um, this was from my book, Ruins. Um, and uh, it was, I was following the migration of insects. This is how I do these drawings there. Um, I, I start out with a little rough pencil, then I go to a tighter pencil, then I ink that enlarged to the size. Uh, um, uh, I, my, my, this pencil is done at the size of the book. So I didn't, I, I could put tons of details in, but not more than I would see when I look at the page. And then I blow that up 25% uh, and ink it and then uh, scan it. And this is digitally colored. Um, and I've done that with a number of books and projects over the years. I've also experimented with stencils. This is a, uh, uh, I would pencil a drawing and then enlarge it and cut a stencil completely insane. That's how I did a lot of my illustration work. So those are holes in paper. And then I sprayed it with spray paint, red paint, and then black on top of that without moving the stencil. And you get something that looks like this. And then I go in with watercolor and colored pencil. And this is an, a wordless book that I did, which probably helped get me the spy versus spy job. Um, I've done adaptations of Alice in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass. In this case, it was for a Mexican company. Um, that's Richard Nixon as the, uh, so you can always work politics into pretty much everything. And I can work my daughter into things. She was my model for Alice. Um, metamorphosis, uh, I, that was when that shift I mentioned happened. I was able to do work for mainstream publishers and start getting actually paid to do what I was, what I wanted to do. And then of course there, there's Kafka. This is the Spanish edition of it. And, um, with all my books, I, I do that. Uh, there's one of my cartoons from the New Yorker. Um, I also stylistically jump around. I, I'm really fortunate because I've gotten to a point where what I promote in my work is my ideas so that I'm not stuck with a style. Style to me is like clothing that you, you know, you wear it too long and it starts to smell. You need to wash it once in a while. And you know, what was looked good in the sixties and or seventies, may not look, you know, a shag haircut may not look as good now. Um, and uh, some, what, another one of my cartoons, a lot of cartoons about, about uh, a certain ex-president um, that uh, don't look too closely, it can cause blind rage, like the eclipse. And uh, there's the wall that Mexico would pay for. So yes, yeah, and the bomb is constantly showing up in my work. That's, that's, a, that's a through line. And here we are in the United States, and I'm sure you're experiencing your version of it with all the insane anti-vaxxing and uh, various things like that. And we have our uh, everything going on with uh, Black Lives Matter and, and uh, police brutality. Um, this is my image of 
of what happened one million minutes before coronavirus, how that hit us. And uh, there's, I, I love doing takeoffs on things like uh, Dr. Seuss and there's our mail service. But you know, you don't always have to draw things the way they are. You can sometimes draw things the way you want them to be. I try to, I try to ha maintain some optimism. If nothing else, I want to, uh, you know, um, draw in the face of destruction. And um, you know, maybe uh, you know the way political art and music has influenced me. I still listen to all kinds of music from the 60s, Bob Dylan and things that were what people used as the flag that they marched under. And that meant the world to me. Mad Magazine meant the world to me. And I uh, I hope I'm doing something similar. And as it says here in Spanish, the revolution will not be televised, but I believe it will be illustrated. And on that note, I will stop my share. And if you have some questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Okay. Uh, do we maybe have some questions in the audience? Uh, could you tell us something about um, your adaptations of uh, the works of Franz Kafka and how you, how you um, became interested in this particular writer? Uh, did you uh, understood? Uh, so, uh, how did you came, uh, uh, became interested in Franz Kafka particularly? Yes. Um, so, I had a friend who, I, I thought of Franz Kafka, having read The Metamorphosis in high school, as being very dark and depressing. And uh, I had a friend who loved Kafka, and we uh, drink beers, probably get stoned, and he'd read Kafka short stories aloud, and we would laugh our heads off. And I thought, wow, there's a lot of humor in Kafka. This was back in, in the 80s. And I went home and I did a, I did a Kafka story at, in, in comics, and it instantly clicked together for me as, as it made complete sense. And I felt like uh, he was a comics was a perfect vehicle for Kafka because there's all this irony and subtle humor and things I could show, you know, his words would say one thing and I could show another, but also his words acted as an anchor so that I could play around with, with different designs. And as you can see from the exhibition and from the, the, uh, the recently published books, I, I'm doing some kind of crazy comic designs in a lot of them where uh, the storytelling isn't like panel to panel, simple things like that. It, it straddles illustration and comics and something else, but his words act as this anchor that allows me to play around. And I really felt like he was kind of whispering in my ear. It's also, I really recommend doing adaptations, working with the dead writers because they don't complain about what you do. I'm sure Kafka would have been quite upset since he originally had told his executor before he died to burn all of his unpublished manuscripts, which is most of what I ended up adapting. Um, and the titles to them were, were actually written in most cases by Max Brode, his executor. Um, of course, if Kafka really didn't want us to see those things, he would have burned it himself. So, you know, his executor didn't listen to him. And, and so I felt a little freedom to do the same. Um, but Kafka it was, is to me like the perfect meeting between between the between writing and and picture and the 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 breadth of possibility for interpreting his work. Like for example, I made a hunger artist into a woman. Um, it, it, that that there was nothing that said it, that that couldn't be the case. Um, eating issues seem like it would be really appropriate. Actually, in the show, you'll see it's it's I have it as a, a man, but in the book, it's a woman because I realized when. <laughs> When the American edition was first published, I realized that I had a yet another opportunity, so I redrew it as, as a woman. Um, or, for example, I uh, this short story, The Trees, I turned into being about a homeless person. And that's just my interpretation. Is that what Kafka was thinking? Was he thinking about civil rights when he wrote um, Before the Law? 
Um, many of these things probably not, but that's the beauty of, of his work. It's, it transcends time and it speaks to each of us differently. And as I said, I hope people will go back to the original text, read them. And some of these short stories are, are literally, you know, a paragraph long and, uh, um, and then see what images come to them. Maybe some other questions from the audience? Well, uh, I would also like to ask you, since uh, obviously you have quite some material uh, for comics yourself, uh, how come uh, you chose uh, to do these uh, already written books and you made them into comic? Uh, why would you translate them into another media? Um, at the time that I started doing Kafka in particular, part of, part of it was that people were not, in the United States, did not see comics as being something that could be for adults. There were a few examples, like Mouse, for example, but overall, again and again, when I talked to people about comics, they, they certainly either didn't read them at all thought they were for children, didn't think that they could tackle subject matter that was more serious. Um, I was doing that in World War III and I was, I was doing my own comics like that for publications like Fantagraphics and it had a very small audience. And I, I felt that the, in, in part, I mean, I'm riding on the coattails of Kafka a bit, uh, admittedly, I, people would know Kafka and they go, oh, wait a minute, Kafka comics. And they, they might look at that and, it would help open their eyes to this form and the possibilities of it as not just being for children. And it certainly has actually worked that way. There was one, one aspect of working it that way, which then, you know, leads them to other things in comics and that, you know, but again, I started doing that in 1988. It wasn't until the year 2000 when uh, Chris Ware's Jimmy Corrigan and uh, a number of other uh, bigger publishers like Pantheon, in the United States were publishing more adult books that were getting recognized as being like, oh, that's literature, that's an art form. But, but we, we literally were struggling with the idea of it being considered an art form. So I was trying many different methods. I, I teach, but I also just in the, in the, the form of comics, I tried autobiography, I tried uh, uh, adaptation. I liked all of those things. I liked not having to, to have it just be my own stories and see what, when somebody else had a story, how I might interpret it. It gave me a tremendous amount of freedom. And then that Kafka's writing then got back into my writing in other, in other things I did that um, helped me uh, do more unusual comics of my own but I, I blame Kafka for some some of these storytelling ideas that I I got. They they were, they were sort of a melding there. Um, when I do an adaptation now, a lot of it is the joy of it's sort of like taking a class in an author. And you know, I'm not no longer in college, but this is somebody giving them the opportunity. And yes, it's self serving in that way. Um, but as I as I said, you only have an audience of one. So I do things as often as possible that are interesting to me. And so studying uh, Heart of Darkness, studying me the metamorphosis in a really detailed way for a year, uh, uh, being in touch with other authors, uh, writers who might be involved in the subject, um, all the different ways that um, things I have to do in researching in order to do a, 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 a good version of the adaptation is for me like taking a class in that author and that just expands my own general knowledge. Um, currently, I, I, last year I had a fellowship at the New York Public Library uh, and I spent um, 10 months, um, they gave me a room at the, at the New York Public Library, the library on 42nd Street and I studied insects and um, I'm, I'm on a road to do a, an eventual book about the intersection between insects and humans, how we through thousands of years, uh, the Egyptians had the scarab dung beetle as part of their hieroglyphics, um, how Aristotle studied metamorphosis, how uh, different artists and uh, entomologists 
um, studied insects through the years and also the insects themselves, their own stories. And I'm being able in this process to spend um, years studying insects, which is something that I've been interested in since I was a child as a citizen scientist. I, I'm never taking much of a biology class, but I'm starting to like get my knowledge up on that. And just because comics is such an odd form, uh, I'm able to reach out to um, people who are in the top of their field in studying insects. And they're happy to talk to me because they're happy to talk to anybody who's interested in what they're interested in, especially since I'm drawing these things and, and helping bring more people to the subject that they're, that they have been, they're kind of like comic artists in the eighties struggling to get people to look at the, this, their own uh, form of science, which is considered to be, it's only getting more um, considered to be more of a science relatively recently. So it's, it, it's a kind of a similar thing, but this is one of the joys of uh, and fortunes of, of the kind of work I do that I get to keep studying and being curious and exploring things that are, you know, both entertaining and also um, and, and make a living at it. And that, that's I, I'm still I'm still in shock that I, that that's been possible at all. Since you needed to do research both for the comics about insects and for Kafka, would you say that you found it harder to do a comic about Kafka since there is so many literary critics who already know Kafka, so the one way of literary form was already done, but I believe there's not so many comics about insects, so people are probably happy if there would be one new already. From the well, it, that, that's that's a really good point. No, it, as you might guess, I was I was very nervous about the reception. I, you know, I'm I'm taking one one of the greatest authors of the 20th century, and and I'm going I'm going to do comics with this. Um, and you know, and who am I to do that? Um, I um, so I I felt very nervous, and I felt uh, under a microscope like a bug. Uh, like Gregor Samsa doing, you know, trying to trying to take on something as big as that. And same with Heart of Darkness as well. I had to kind of put that out of my mind in order to work on, on it and not um, take it really seriously. So like, okay, I know I'm doing something that could, that, that if I, if I mess up, I'm, I, the, the criticism is going to come down on me. Um, and that certainly was the, the case with, with Heart of Darkness as well, because there's, all the racist issues that surround the book. And I was trying to show it to as, as many people with a broader sense of these, the subject as, as I could to make sure that I, you know, was covering my bases. The same though is true with the insects because the entomology world is very, very, um, they know their stuff. And if I draw an insect and the wing isn't exactly right, they're telling me, and this is one of the reasons why I've reached out to people in, in the entomological, biological, paleontological world is because they're going to tell me that I got something wrong, like the most minute thing. And I know most readers won't notice those things, but I'm really working very hard to have it be that somebody who's an expert will look at what I'm doing and feel that, you know, with confidence that I have honored the subject. Um, if if we have a minute more, I can show you a few drawings from that. Do we? Are we done, or or can I show you something else? Uh, yes, of course you can. I'll, I will. I'll show you a, a quick something. Give me a moment here to get to my uh, folder um, that uh, um, for this uh, exhibition. Um, uh, one moment. Um, so. I'm going to show you how. Uh, hold on one sec. Um, Maybe just a quick question. Uh, so you got those yes, butterflies? Yes, please ask, with... ask away while I'm doing this. Uh -huh. Okay, and I'll, I'm going to share a screen in one moment. Um, and let's 
sorry, the joys of technology. We go almost there. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so this is this is a quick view of what the show that I'm putting up is going to look like uh, at the New York Public Library. I'm having an exhibition opening in um, uh, at the uh, <laughs> next month, so rather quickly. Um, so I wandered around in the library, and because of COVID, um, everything was empty. I'm putting things on the ceiling. I'm planning on putting things on the ceiling. Um, hold on, I'll move you over here. Um, there's a uh, I got to study in the various rooms of the library and then I put insects in there because um, the library was essentially um, uh, empty of people. It was closed to the public. And so I uh, inserted insects into the, into the scene. And then I, um, um, and this is another opportunity for me to bring comics to people who wouldn't think of comics in this way. There's one whole hallway that's going to be for, um, the uh, monarch butterflies from my book Ruins. Um, and there's a great quote from the uh, entomologist uh, E.O. Wilson that says, if all mankind were to disappear, the world would regenerate back to the rich state of equilibrium that existed 10,000 years ago. If insects were to vanish, the environment would collapse into chaos. And part of what I am hoping I will do with this show is make people more aware and sensitive to uh, these little tiny creatures that we often just swat away or ignore. And uh, my hope is I'm gonna have that banner in front of the library. That, that was my proposal. This hasn't happened yet. So, um, but I figure if I show them what I'd like to do, maybe they'll say yes. So that's just a little little view of, of some of it, but I've, I've, uh, I've done about 80 pages of comics and biographies so far but I want to make it a 300 page book. So I'll be studying for years to come. So you got those butterflies behind you all also for the comic or you? Uh, <laughs> no, that's just some art. That's just some art. To, um, there's, there's one, these butterflies right here. My parents brought me when I was eight years old from Mexico. Um, I've, I've had a number of things that have followed me around through my life, fortunately. And some of it is, you know, and I would say as a, um, suggestion to people who are interested in these arts um, that what I think of as a way to have find uh, success uh, and and to do something new in in many forms is a hybrid which is to say taking more than one thing and putting it together and so one of the things that I say in my classes the question I ask is what are you passionate about and it's very hard sometimes to know what that is. A lot, a lot of us are like, well, well, gee, what am I passionate about? And if you take some time to think about that um, and identify hopefully more than one thing. I mean, if you're interested in music and comics, then you can do comics about music, biographies about, about you know, musicians, um, or figure out a way to bring music into comics in multimedia. Um, my interest in insects was a very, it was kind of like a background thing. And I just suddenly realized, I. I mean, I'd love to spend more time looking into this and dinosaurs. I love, I love, like, you know, like many of us really interested in that. I barely knew the history I've been studying it for the last year. Um, so I'm learning about six extinctions that happened, the Permian extinction, these things that, you know, where it happened and why it happened. And that's, that's actually bleeding into my other current work, but it, it, I, I think that, you know, that question that, that all of us can ask, like, what are you passionate about? And, and if you find multiple things, then think about how you can put those things together to make a new thing that's, that, that's the coupling of, of more than one um, idea uh, and, 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 and maybe art form and, and area. Um, and I think that's how you actually make something new uh, maybe we have uh, time for one quick question from the audience. Maybe some new questions erupted in the meanwhile. Okay, if not, maybe just one quick question from me. Uh, since you did a lot of work uh, on political comics as well, I'm wondering, did you ever had some problems with the government or with the officials because of it? 
Well, I had a direct experience thanks to Strip Burger. Um, I the Richie Bush uh, cartoon that I showed you um, that was published in Strip Burger, and they sent some copies back to the United States to be distributed. Not not that many. They arrived in North Carolina. Of the five percent of the shipments that people uh, that the customs officials look into. This was one of the 5%, as it turned out. Um, and apparently the customs officials in, in, um, in North Carolina um, were fans of George Bush at the time. And they stopped the shipment. And they said that my drawing of Bush as Richie Rich was piracy. And it took the Comic Book Legal Defense Fund uh, to come in there with a, a group of lawyers to prove that, th that um, it was parody, which is legal in the United States. Um, and that, um, in fact, what was, what was very funny was that um, the publisher of Richie Rich had seen my, my parody and thought it was very funny. So, but it took that, it took some time to get those copies released. So, so Strip Burger, we, we have a connection with, with uh, um, censorship. Um, I, I've had things censored in, in a more um, subtle way, which is uh, during, right after 9-11, it was very difficult to get work published that had any criticism of going to war, um, things like that. We published an issue of World War III, which was one of our most popular issues, um, because people were desperate for information. I couldn't get anything out that, that wasn't pro-war in most uh, publications. And I was turning down work that was pro-war, like Time Magazine wanted me to illustrate articles that were... Um, basically, you know, why we need to go, you know, bomb Iraq. And I was not doing that. So I had to not do work in one way. And then I would put forward work that they would give me some excuse for why it wasn't correct until they had watered it down to being not saying almost anything. Um, at one point, I used the symbol of there was a, there was a very famous um, image of a man uh, with a hood on. And uh, this is in, in Iraq standing on a box holding these electrodes with a hood on his head. You may remember this. Um, and they said, oh, that's an overused symbol. Well, it had happened the week before. And I said, no, it, it's just become a symbol. It's what we now will understand as a symbol for that. I happen to have the wires leading back to the White House um, and, and they didn't want to publish that in the New York Times. Um, so um, that's the way a lot of censorship happens is that it just, things just don't get published. And many things I did for Time Magazine, um, they, they, I did them, they were with an article. And then when I opened the magazine, it wasn't published. There was a different article and that wasn't showing what I was showing. Another thing that happened to me, um, back in 1994, there was an artist who worked for World War III and had published work elsewhere named Mike Diana. And he did very strong, um, graphics. He self-published this little comic called Boiled Angel that almost no one saw, but he happened to be in Florida. And um, he was working in a convenience store, like working, you know, selling coffee and peanuts. And uh, at night, he used their copy machine to photocopy his little fanzine. And um, he accidentally left it on the copy machine and the cleaning woman saw it. And she turned it into the police. It had images of Jesus with an erection, and um, there was um, a very big interest in serial killers and lots of things. Well, you know, he had a he had a religious uh, upbringing. I, I, there seemed to be some questionable abuse in his past that he was getting out through his comics, and the, the, all of the United States and probably the world is is interested in serial killers. It's on every other news program, so he wasn't doing anything that special. Um, but this was considered offensive. And the policeman who received the book pretended to be a fan, wrote to Mike Diana over a period of two years. And when Mike Diana sent him his fanzine, he, they called it uh, trafficking over the, like across state lines, or they had some reason and it became an obscenity trial. And, um, and Mike Diana got put in jail for this. Um, I was called down by the same comic book legal defense fund that had helped me get, strip burger released and uh to a trial in florida and so i was a an expert witness for a trial um for mike diana and um it was clear no matter what i said or did or what anybody else said or did the all-white much older uh florida jury had found 
him guilty of obscenity before he walked into the courtroom. And he ended up um, being told he couldn't draw anything obscene, even for himself at home. Um, and he was such an obsessive drawer that he would go into the bathroom and he had like a, I was like a two year period of, of being under, they said, the police can basically show up at your house at any time to check that you're not drawing anything obscene. And um, he would go into the bathroom, draw something obscene, and then flush, rip it up and flush it down the toilet so he could do this. So that was, that was back when I definitely felt during the um, last president, whose name I can't say any more than I want to say Voldemort, um, uh, that there was a chill in the air around it. It was I was allowed to do things for many publications, but I sensed the the an environment that that could change at really any moment uh i was looking at the late night news shows like stephen colbert and uh the daily show and things like that and i thought when they get dragged off the stage i i know i'll it won't be long before i'm next um and it's very hard to say whether in, in these united states in the next few years whether democracy is going to survive and whether the kinds of things i do will be considered a seditious act or not, but um, uh, and, you know uh, the 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 biggest thing that happens is you can't get things published and you're ignored, um, and that um, you know not necessarily a jail sentence, but a uh, but you're you're ignored out of existence and um, and part of the struggle is to get these ideas out in front of people. Okay, well, unfortunately, we ran out of time, so I'm very looking forward to seeing you in person. Uh, probably some more questions will erupt by then. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for this masterclass. We will enjoy reading your comics further on. I hope you continue with the, uh, with publishing in Streetburger as well. Uh, Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, that was the masterclass from Peter Cooper. Thank you.